May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. On this rainy day, after having been away uh, in Austin, Texas, for a week after Easter, I must say it's wonderful to uh, be back. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I think is very important in uh, the gospel passage contained in the gospel of Luke today. And in order to do so, I need to point out to you that uh, what we just read together is what's called a resurrection or even post-resurrection narrative in the gospel of Luke. And it's Jesus coming to his apostles, to his beloved community, after his death, and even after his resurrection from the dead, and illuminating to them what the meaning of Scripture is all about in the big picture. What Jesus is doing is opening up their minds so that they become much more than just simply fishermen, or whatever it was that they did, and understand the big picture of what it means essentially to be a human being made in the image and likeness of God. And if that's the focal point of understanding today's scripture, then we've had a good beginning indeed. So what Jesus does is he comes to them and they don't believe, they're frightened and other things about seeing Jesus in his resurrected form. And so what Jesus does is he honors being amongst them by identifying himself as a human being. That's the whole understanding of why it is that he ate the fish that was broiled by one of the apostles. He ate the fish and allowed them to touch him, to say, feel my hands and touch my feet, because what he was doing underneath it all was saying there was something worthy and something uh, uh, worthwhile about being a human being. There is the first and great lesson contained in this gospel passage today, that there's something worthy about being a human being. And you say, well, of course there is. That's just taken for granted. And that seems obvious at first of all, but it's not necessarily obvious at all. In fact, the whole history of human civilization has been the growing awareness and the pull and push and the tug and the ups and the downs of being able, as we say in our baptismal covenant, to respect the dignity of every human being. And so what Jesus is saying is, is that in the post-resurrection narrative, you need to understand and you need to fully comprehend what it means when God says, I honor this creation and I honor human beings. Now that's quite a statement. It doesn't mean, therefore, that God is wrathful and vengeful and just desires the obliteration of humanity at all. And furthermore, it doesn't mean that human beings are called, therefore, to obliterate other human beings. It's the clear gospel clarion against war, for example or for whatever reason, diminishes the worthwhileness and the importance of being a human being created in the image and likeness of God. And so what Jesus is saying is, is that not only do we need to honor other human beings and uphold their dignity, uphold their worth, because they're created worthwhile by God in the first place, but also you and I are worthy. You and I are worthy. Now you say, well, of course we are, except we're always haunted, I think, at some level and in some way by our own unworthiness. And sometimes that becomes a great barrier between ourselves and God. That um, almost instinct on the part of the evil one to say, no, you're not worthy. Remember this post-resurrection narrative when those thoughts occur to you. You are worthy. 
You're so worthy that Jesus himself opted after his death on the cross and even after his resurrection from the tomb not to go directly to God, but rather to come back even after the resurrection from the tomb and to be with the apostles at least for a while. I mean, that has to say that there's something that God values and cherishes and honors in being with us. And so therefore, you are worth something. <clears throat> you are worth something, and everybody else who has been created by God is worthy. That's the call to civilization, the call to be become civilized and indeed to become human. Recognize we are of great value, and so are others. Now, that's the first point I want to make, and I hope you hear it. You are worthy, and so are other human beings. And the second and third points come to me from a sense of how God operates and how we operate in relationship to God. And I draw upon my source. Uh, one of the best uh, scholars of Hebrew scriptures in the 20th, 21st century, a fellow named Walter Brueggemann, <coughs> reading I came across recently in um, a book called And Finally Come the Poets. And what Walter Brueggemann has found out, he's now, uh, I think in his late 70s, and has written prolifically over the years. And what he has discovered in his studies of both the Hebrew scriptures and of the Christian scriptures is that there is a covenant relationship with God that makes us alive, that makes us come alive through our spirit if we allow that covenantal relationship to develop. So that relationship with God, whether you're in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, your relationship with Yahweh, or whether you're in the Christian scriptures, your relationship with Jesus is what is of paramount importance in your life. And that's the glory you see of the Jewish people and the glory of Christianity that somehow or another, minute by minute if possible, we're aware of how much we're in contact with God whether it's God is expressed in Yahweh or whether it's God is expressed in Jesus, is almost of secondary consequence in this respect. What is important is, is that you become alive in terms of how you are in relationship with God. And what Walter Brueggemann says is the obvious, and that is that there are times in our lives, indeed in all of human life, ever since the beginning of creation, that's what the story of Adam and Eve is all about, when we choose not to be in relationship with God. That there's something innate about humanity that errs and falls and moves into areas that are less than life-giving. Uh, the church has called it sin. The um, wider community would call it any number of things. But it's not being in relationship with God. And what Brueggemann says is, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, you get time and time again instances where God, because God is in covenant with us, you see. If God is a vital force in your life, you realize that. And God is in covenant with us. And God, therefore, is disappointed, frustrated, even sometimes perhaps angry because of those times in our lives, either individually or as a people, when we sin. Does this make any sense to you? You're looking at me like you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> it's what our faith and all of our scriptures call us to see. You see, God initially, what Brueggemann says, is very disappointed in us and unapproving of sinful behavior. Now some of you are starting to shake your heads. Okay? And we become alive when we begin to realize, however we realize it, that yes, we have engaged in disappointing behavior. It's like a child 
who does something that's not acceptable behavior. My little three-year-old uh, three granddaughter was visiting the week before Easter and took one of those magic markers, not so magical at all, and drew something that she thought was a masterpiece on one of our sofas. <laughs> well, let me tell you, that may not have been sinful behavior to God, but it was darn sinful behavior to my concern. And so she needed to do something. She needed to recognize that this was unacceptable behavior. And that's what God is all about in a covenantal relationship. What God says is, look folks, I'm going to tell you that I'm disappointed in your behavior. And I will tell you that in any number of ways. If we violate the way that we treat the environment, in a sense, God is telling us, look, you've got to recognize that and do something about it. Now, that's the first step. The recognition that we have done something that needs to be corrected. And therefore, we as a church call it repentance. We call it getting back on our knees, we call it crying, we call it making confession, we call it a number of things, but basically you don't become human unless you understand that to some extent we're all prodigal sons. And to some extent we need to have that aha moment when we waken up and say, I need to do something about it and I can do something about it. I can ask God for forgiveness. Because if God is the most important relationship in your life, then that's the person that you need to establish and reestablish a relationship with. Now are you getting it? Okay. So the amazing thing that Brookman says is, is the first thing that he has seen in all of his years of study in both the Hebrew Testament and in the Christian Testament is that God is frustrated. God is disappointed in our wayward behavior, but if we realize that, if we want to do our share in reestablishing the relationship with God, then what we need to do is to ask for God's forgiveness, and the second thing that Brueggemann finds is that God is always eager to forgive. Always! No matter how heinous the crime, imagine what David did as the leader of the Jewish people, and yet God forgave David and restored David to a sense of working and service in God's kingdom. Now, that's a great illustration, but it happens to each and every one of us if we'll just come to our senses, and that's what the church, I think, in part, is all about. We tend to base coming to church in terms of, well, it's the right thing to do, or it's we ought to go to church, and our children and grandchildren ought to go to church because it's the nice thing to do. Folks, it's much deeper than that. Much, much deeper. You have to hear me when I say this. You're coming to church because you're recognizing that something that was amiss in your lives needed correcting, and you've already taken that step even before you came into church. You realize that there was a relationship with God that needed further development, fulfillment, if you will. And you already took steps. I assume that you're here because you already know that there's something amiss in your life. And you've done something to correct it. And therefore, coming to church is an example of the way that you re-embrace that covenant with God. Not because of the weather. Not because of whether or not you're on a spring break from schools. But you're coming to church because of something much more important and much deeper than that. You're coming to church because you're saying to God, thank you, I want to be with you again. And boy, did I ever miss, me, miss you when I was out in the wilderness. Now that is life transforming. That's why we come to worship. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this, in this gospel passage. If we'll just let the scriptures speak. What God is calling us toward is, first of all, perhaps a little bit less than pleasant news. 
Take responsibility for yourself. Be accountable for your actions and realize who you are, flaws and all. Get real because in getting real you become human. And in getting real not only do you ask for God's forgiveness, but then you participate in the joy of being forgiven, of new life and of resurrection. And so therefore coming to church is not a motorist task at all. It's not getting up in the morning and saying, oh, why should I come to church? You're already ready to come to church, or you're already ready to pray in the morning, or you're already ready to talk with other people about the magnificence of God because you realize that you are the prodigal son, and you are forgiven for that. Now, that's the power of today's gospel passage. May it live in you. May it come alive even more in you. That's why you are here in this moment. Amen. 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 Now let us stand and say aloud together the night. We believe in one God.